start uh, the year, uh, maybe in a few minutes, I encourage you to uh, bow your heads and just spend some alone time with God. Um, just reflect through your week, whatever you can do. Let's give it all to God. Uh, and just come with an open heart, open mind, to receive what God has in store for us. gathered in this place today, thanking you for all that you do and all that you've done and all that you will do. We anticipate good things. We anticipate your power and your presence here. We anticipate you ministering in a real and authentic way. Would you touch each one of us, I pray. Would you allow us to have your an experience of your presence and your spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Be yourself here. Do whatever it is that you want to do, but do something, we ask, that you would minister, Lord Jesus, and that your name would be ultimately glorified in greater and greater ways. We ask that there, our worship would be pleasing to you. We would ask that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive what your spirit would say to this church. We ask that you would minister through the those that are playing and those that are serving, that you would allow us, Lord God, your grace in greater and greater amounts. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn around and greet a couple people in Jesus' name and thank them for coming. We're going to worship. Yes, yeah. 
Scripture was intended, publicly read it together. We're going through 2 Peter right now. And so let's look to 2 Peter. I'll read verse 1, you read verse 2, and we'll go back and forth that way. So Rocky, do you mind putting it up there, please? Not there? Ah, there we go. So this is part of worship. <clears throat> so then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You will you will be to the Lord you have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, the immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. But remember that they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. <clears throat> the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. <laughs> Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. May God add his blessing to what we've just read. And you may be seated here at the church for the Turkey and Syrian support. And you just put it on your envelope. Like there's an offering envelopes that it's for that. And we'll make sure that it gets to the right places that it's supposed to. So how are you all doing today? Huh? You sure? Yeah, you, you try to convince me, huh? 
I'm glad to be here. I hope that you are too. My name is Jeff, and I'm glad that uh, we have a chance to worship the Lord together. Now I get to talk about Jesus and about God and about what God does in our lives. I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for beaming us here, and thank you for the opportunity we have. Would you give us ears to hear? And would you allow our hearts to be moved and touched by your power and your presence? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Every year on, on November the 11th, something happens in Canada. November 11th is the day that we have Remembrance Day. Now, that's a you know half a year away still. But Canadians meet at cenotaphs all across the country. And they remember something. They remember and honor people who fought, who were wounded, and those who died in wars that represent us and our country and protecting our nation. And what we, while we consider, when we consider what happened in the last century, in the 1900s, there was the war to end all wars. That was back in 1914 to about 1918. The war to end all wars. That's what they called it. And then there was a worldwide war that happened after that in 1939 to 1945. So the war to end all wars didn't end wars. But there was another big war after that. And then there was other wars after that. There was a Korean War. There was a Vietnam War. There was uh, wars over in the Middle East, left, right, and center. There were all sorts of things that were going on. And in most of those conflicts, Canadian people, Canadian men, and then later on some ladies, were involved. And they fought. And they fight even up until today. And it's very easy to attach the word sacrifice to many of the events that happened within all of those hostilities and all of those um, conflicts. Young men, young women sacrificed their well-being. They sacrificed their, their relationships. They sacrificed uh, and their lives, even some of them, in order to defend their families, to defend their nations, to defend their ways of life, and to defend our freedom. They sacrificed. They, they went. They left their families. They left their loved ones. They left their, their places of work. And they went and they trained. And they went and they went overseas, some of them. And they went and they fought for our freedoms. They sacrificed. They're a tangible example of what the word sacrifice means. And today, this, the, the topic that I'm talking about is make great sacrifices. But going to war, is that the only uh, meaning of the word sacrifice? Does the word sacrifice have other meanings as well? Well, of course it does. And that's what... Why, why, uh, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning uh, in the challenge of making great sacrifices. This sermon is on the lines of, uh, along the lines of other sermons I've preached lately, and it's from a book called Good to Great in God's Eyes by Chip Ingram. And along the way, I've talked about where we can pray great prayers. We can dream great dreams. We can take great risks. We can do other things that are along this line in order to become who God has designed us to be. And today it's about sacrifice. Make great sacrifices. And if you give some thought to it, a sacrifice is giving up something you value for the sake of something else which you regard as more important or worthy. That's what a sacrifice means. 
Now what I'm talking about here with regard to the definition can be illustrated actually by a sport, by a game called baseball. In baseball, there's a play called the sacrifice fly. Anybody know baseball at all? You know, the, it's, it's a sport that we play. And the, what, what a sacrifice fly is, is when a player is on base and there is no one out or only one person out in the inning. And there's already a player on base. And the batter comes up to bat. And normally the batter wants to hit and get what they call a hit, the, where, where, where they get on base. But in this case, because of the situation in the game, what the batter does is tries to hit the ball as far as they can in the air so that the player on base can move up at least one or two bases and maybe even home. And instead of trying to... Um, get on base, they intentionally hit the ball so that it is caught way out, as far out in the outfield as they can. And they call that a sacrifice fly because the player that is hitting the ball is sacrificing their individual opportunity to get on base. And they're doing it in order uh, that the team in that situation will be better. It's a sacrifice fly. And that's another meaning for the word sacrifice. As you probably know, I like to ask questions, so here's a couple to think about. First, do you admire somebody who makes a sacrifice? Why? Why do you admire somebody who makes a sacrifice? Here's another question. Do you admire somebody who, who, in your opinion, has, the, has a sense of entitlement? They're entitled to what they have. Do you admire that? The question is why? why? Probably why don't you admire that? See, these are things we, we don't even think about at times, but, but they're there. We typically admire someone who makes a sacrifice. And we typically don't admire somebody who we feel has a sense of entitlement. Now many of us come really down really hard on those who we feel are being selfish, who are being entitled, don't we? We come down hard on it. We talk about it. We say, oh, that person, they, you know, is this or that, and, and it's usually in negative terms. Let me, use, let, me, let me tell you a story to illustrate what I'm talking about. Back in the early 2000s, there was a very concerning situation that was happening here in North America concerning a virus. But it wasn't COVID. It was H1N1. H1N1. And it had a real potential to become what COVID became for us. H1N1 was really, really bad. I mean, it was far worse in some ways than COVID was. And at the time, there was a vaccine that was developed. But it was just being distributed slowly. And because it was, uh, it was early in the process, you know, they, they, they had kind of worked it out how they were going to get it. Out, and whether they even needed to get it out into the mass public or not. But something happened at that time in the center of the universe, a place we call Toronto. And what happened was there was a lot of um, uh, nurses and medical people who were getting very, very sick and even dying as a result of H1N1. They were working in hospitals. But there was also this hockey organization that made a lot of news because they jumped the queue. And they didn't have to wait in line for the distribution of the vaccine for H1N1. And these guys 
all these healthy, healthy, phys you know, athletes got this vaccine in order to keep playing hockey. Meanwhile, frontline medical workers who are actually dealing with H1N1 patients had to wait for their shots. And the complaint was the situation wasn't just. The hockey team, they were a, well, a group of well-paid athletes who many of us suspected had a sense of entitlement. And when stuff like this happens, we're outraged. And because amongst other things, we don't see sacrifice happening. Am I right? So time for another question. When it comes to God and you, how much of you do you think he wants? 50%? 80? 90? Or all of you? Now why do you think that is? Let's look at Romans uh, 12.1, just so you know that we're on the right track with this. Romans 12.1. It's going to be up here. I appeal to you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You know, that's probably the primary reference in the Bible, you know, that's made up of letters and poetry and his history and gospels and wisdom and law telling us how much God wants. But the idea is all over the place in Scripture. This is the deal. God wants everything from you. Everything. And that's a different kind of sacrifice than the baseball kind I was talking about earlier. This isn't about a sacrifice fly. This is about everything. Let's see if I can explain what I'm talking about. There are many cultures, even today. We don't hear about it much, and we don't see it on TV, or, but you can probably find YouTube videos, probably. There's a YouTube video for just about everything now. But they have, that these cultures are what we call sacrificial cultures. The Old Testament. The Old Testament was a sacrificial culture. And what that meant was they would take animals and they would check the animals out and they were, if they were of a certain age and a certain quality, they would butcher those animals ritually in order to share the good, you know, to share the salvation that would come as a result of it. And the meaning of this kind of sacrifice isn't about a fly ball or a baseball, but it, it's about giving up everything because the animals... These sacrifices don't get up off the altar. They die. They're burned up. There's nothing but ashes left. And this is the kind of picture that Paul has in mind in Romans 12.1. Chip Ingram, in his book that I talked about a little bit earlier, has a great analogy about this kind of a sacrifice. He writes, We don't live in an agrarian society, so this picture of offering the best animal of the flock is foreign to us. I envision the modern day equivalent to be like seeing your entire life as a blank check. Then in view of your love for God and confidence in his goodness to you, signing the bottom of the check. Then you take the check, slide it under the door of heaven's throne room and say, Lord, fill it out however you want to fill it. You tell me what you want to do, want me to do, where you want me to go, what you want me to give, and who you want me to serve. Whatever you write, whatever you write on the top of the check, that's what I'll do. <laughs> There's a certain demographic in this room that probably has never written a check or seen a check. And I get that. But this is the deal. Here's what a check looks like. So, just so you know, I'm going to teach you about a check. You put the date on, right over here. You've got to write the date, okay? 
Then you write out P to the order of. And you put something in there. You put some name or some organization or some company. That's what you do. Then down here is where you put the amount. And you write out the amount, you know, $1,000. And then over here, you put it in numbers. So you put $1,000, whatever the amount is that you want your check to represent. And then you sign it. This is the deal. You don't sign this check unless you put an amount in. Because if you don't put an amount in, it's called a blank check. Okay? And what that means is you've signed the bottom of that check and you're saying whatever amount is put there, I will pay. That's what a blank check is. So in, a, in other words, I got this off the internet obviously, right? God our Heavenly Father. You sign the bottom, you sign the time, the day, and you leave it blank. And you say, God, whatever you put in, that's what I'll pay. That's sacrifice. That's being a living sacrifice. It means that whatever it is that you're going to pay, or God wants you to, you'll pay. You see, you'd never ever hand a, a check over with the, with the name on the bottom and the amount blank. Because in our legal system, if somebody found that check with your name on the bottom and the date in there, and they put whatever amount in, you'd have to pay it. Even though you didn't intend to. Because that's what a blank check does. And it's this kind of picture that Paul has in mind when he wrote 12, Romans 12.1. And um, people... People have been actually defrauded by this kind of a situation before. Yet in a sense, this is what happened with our friend uh, from the Old Testament by the name of Abraham. Maybe you remember the story from Genesis 22. God told him, take your son, your only son, the one that you love, and take him to the mountain I'll show you, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Kind of crazy stuff that God asks sometimes. So Isaac is the first living sacrifice in history. Now we know that the story was that God provided a sacrifice. We get our songs about Jehovah Jireh from that actual story. Because that's when God is revealed to be God who provides. But um, Isaac was a, a willing participant with Abraham when he took the fire and the wood and the knife to go sacrifice as God commanded Abraham to do. And thankfully, that story worked out for Abraham. God didn't ask him to actually kill his son. Isaac got a reprieve. But there's a second living sacrifice in history and in the scriptures. And his name is Jesus. And he didn't get a reprieve. Isaac got a reprieve, but Jesus didn't. He endured tor torture. He endured death. And he was buried. And it was the end. But death couldn't hold him. And he lives today as a living sacrifice. And the deal is being a living sacrifice changes everything for the sacrifice. Because, being, uh, because living sacrifices are dead. They're dead to their own dreams. They're dead to their own desires. They're dead to their own plans. They're dead. And that's the point. But they're alive. They're alive to something bigger than themselves. They're alive to, their, to God's dreams, God's desires, God's plans. They're alive to God and what He wants to do in your life. Remember last week I said, talk, dream great dreams. Well, this is the opposite side of that coin. Make great sacrifices. Make great sacrifices. You know, living sacrifices have signed the blank check. They've put the date on it. They've put God on the recipient line. And they've put the 
check in God's lap and said, whatever you put on here, whatever you put on here, everything is all God's and it will always be God's. And if you think about it, why would anybody want to be a living sacrifice? I mean, I'm up here preaching this. But why would you want to be that? Well, you do because God did it first. Romans 12.1 urges us to consider this, to consider being a living sacrifice because of what? The mercies of God. The mercies of God. Why would you do this? Because of God's mercy. If we really understood or really understand who Jesus is, and if we really grasp the depth of his goodness and compassion, we realize that he only asks us to leave everything behind because compared to him, everything is second rate. I'd love for us to get this today. You know, Jesus told these parables. It's not part of, I haven't got the, the thing up there. But the parable of the treasure hidden in the field was, there's this guy, and he's out in the field, and he finds a buried treasure. I don't know how he found it, but maybe, you know, he, he uh, kicked it or something and stubbed his toe. But when he opened it up, there's this treasure. And so he hides the treasure, he goes back, and he buys the field. And it costs him all his money. But he does it because there's a treasure in that field that nobody else knew about. And he's overjoyed that he can go, and it's now his treasure. Then Jesus backed that up with another story. He said there was this guy that... that that his, his, his business was to trade pearls. And pearls were precious. And he came across a pearl that he dreamed about, that he thought was the best he'd ever seen. And he realized it was for sale, and he knew what the price was. And he went back and he sold everything he had. And he went and bought that pearl. And he was overjoyed. It's, he sacrificed everything for it. You know what? That's what God wants us to do when it comes to Him. He's that treasure. He's that pearl. And when we give up everything in order to have Him, wow, there's joy there. You know, we're going to be mediocre Christians if we simply go about our day-to-day -day lives. If all we do is sit around and think great thoughts or dream great dreams, and, and then we, we don't go out and actually do things, we'll go from, we won't go from mediocre to good or good to great. Being a living sacrifice requires action. It requires actually moving forward and doing things. You know, the soldiers that we honor on Remembrance Day, they did more than dream. They did more than talk about it around coffee. They did more than, you know, have meetings and, and uh, go over it again and again and again. No. They signed up. They submitted to the training. They practiced. Then they obeyed their orders to go overseas to fight for the, the, their loved ones, their nation, and their freedom. They did something with it. They made a sacrifice. You know, I want to be everything God wants me to be. I want to be everything God dreamed of me to be. And I hope you want that for yourself as well. But to be a great Christian, to be a great Christian, you need to do something. You need to pursue great people. 
You need to take great risks. You need to make great sacrifices. Pursue. Take. Make are all verbs. You know, my mind goes to something Mother Teresa explained once. That one cannot love except at one's expense. One cannot love except at one's expense. And what she was saying is that when our love doesn't really cost anything, it's not love. Love costs. Real love pours out, even when it hurts. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's what Paul says we need to do with our lives in turn. Sacrifice. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus as a living and holy sacrifice? And that's really the key. You're a living sacrifice. It means that the knife hasn't gone in. Your heart hasn't stopped beating. Your brain hasn't stopped thinking. You're a living sacrifice. And as a result, you God, God's the one who's in charge. That's what that means. So, here we are, the end of this today. It's a challenging, challenging message. I get it. But let me ask you, are you growing in loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? That's what a living sacrifice does. The, the, the evidences of that may include stuff like this. If you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, it may show up in your pocketbook. Are you loving the Lord with your pocketbook, with your bank account, <laughs> with your checks? <laughs> How about your mind? Are you renewing your mind with God's Word, with your soul? Are you having deep talks with God? in prayer and personal worship, and with your strength, are you serving others in ministry to them? These are the things that are going to give a life to other people, and they're going to make you stronger and more like whom God wants you to be. You know what sacrifice is? Sacrifice is merely love with clothes on. And where there's great love, there will be great sacrifice. So here we are at the end of this message. Would you guys mind going up and just doing one song? Thank you. While they're getting ready, I'd like us to stand. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to God right now. The challenge that we have right now, Father, is that this is something that sounds a little foreign to our ears. Yet we sing about the sacrifice Jesus made. We sing about how we love him. And yet we have the sense that this is all free of charge. And it is, and I get that. But when we want to grow, when we want to go deep, when we want to be who you meant us to be, who you created us to be, who you dreamed for us to be, there are certain things that are foundational. And one of them, Father, is to love deeply. And with love comes sacrifice. So would you please speak to each person that's here today? about what it is that you want them to, to know, where, where it is you want them to go.
what it is that you want them to do. And we understand that this isn't about gaining salvation. This is about loving you with our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And we want to love our neighbor as ourselves. So help us to be who you have, have dreamed for us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh